I'm going to talk about how uh, pre-construct archaeology managed the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and I'm going to do that by telling you about two sites. Um, uh, Westminster Abbey, I think you know the building. And uh, a site in Shoreditch in East London, a site of Holywell Priory. Um, um, they were both running um, at the same time. Um, they were running before COVID and then the, the COVID pandemic would hit us. So here's the site at um, Westminster Abbey. Um, the site uh, area is, is down here between the north transept and the eastern half of the nave in this area here. Um, it was, um, I think I can see it better on another one. Okay, the site had been used as a burial ground um, for, for, for centuries. And um, this is one of the um, uh, early 11th century um, cis tombs, chalk cis tomb with the, the burial inside it. Um, these burials were um, earlier than the great sacristy, which was also on the site. Um, so as I said, this is 11th century one. Everything was going on very smoothly. It was before the pandemic. Um, we'd been there since the end of uh, 2019. Everybody was very excited. Um, and we revealed the Great Sacristy, which is this uh, L-shaped building that you see here with a room um, at this end. Um, this Great Sacristy had been uh, built in the 13th century. Um, it had been demolished in the middle of the 18th century and lost. Uh, it was refound, apparently, in the, the 19th century, in the 1860s, when they were clearing some rubbish. Um, and then we revealed it. Um, uh, the sacristy is where the monks and the, the clergy would have um, got into the vestments and, and the regalia uh, and then processed into the church. As I said, it was run as a... Um, Warwick Rodwell, who is the, um, the Abbey's consultant archaeologist, described it as a research dig. It was run very much like that. Um, uh, Everything was going swimmingly. It was, it was one of our flagship excavations, as you can imagine. And there, there's a team on the site. Um, the idea was that there wouldn't be any of the pressures that we normally have on a construction site. It was going to be developed later as a new visitor centre, but this was without any of that um, construction pressures. Um, it was all done at a very, very careful pace. It was um, monitored every day. Um, the great and the good would uh, regularly come and visit. And here they are. Um, you've got uh, Chris Mayo at the end there. He's the um, PCA uh, project manager. Warwick Rodwell himself. The supervisor was Joe Brooks, brilliant archaeologist. And we also have Ian Bartlett, who was a clerk of works. Eleanor Lovegrove, the Abbey senior communications manager. All looking at a hole in the ground. <laughs> okay, so it's all very exciting. And at the same time, over in East London, at Shadwell, um, we were also excavating. Uh, here, this is the site of, um, of a, a Holywell Priory, which is an Augustinian nunnery. It was founded in the 12th century. And this was the evalua evaluation stage at the end of 2019. And what we've revealed is a part of the south wall of a church. Um, the, this is the medieval build here, under, under the, with foundations showing there. Um, and then there's a post-medieval wall built on top. Okay, so this was quite exciting. Um, and then we would reveal about 22 metres uh, of the south wall of a church. And this, that, if, is, if you're interested, is some later blocking of the south transept. Didn't quite realise that at the time, but it would become obvious later on. There's some details of the foundation, you know, with the, with the, the chalk in this um, chalk and gravel and chalk. Um, so, quite interesting that it survived all that time. That's because it's been used as a property boundary, which is why it's got the post-medieval build on top. Um, again, very exciting site. But this time, um, we're in the critical path of a construction project. 
completely different. Um, this again is still at that evaluation stage. You can see these cells here, um, the foundations representing cells coming off the south wall. They're actually part of the um, south transept. Um, so there we go. You can see we've had to put in a lot of bracing and stuff to stop everything falling in, which was done by the contractors. Um, we were working very well with them. Um, then we would go in 2020 to the excavation stage. What we've had to do was build a secant wall, or the developers did, built a secant wall. Um, so um, that's part of it on the east side. It was also on the southern side. So that the medieval wall, which I showed you earlier, is actually behind that secant wall. And then we exposed the rest of the archaeology, which has all got to come out. And you're seeing part of a, uh, more of a south transept. Then it's the 26th of March, 2020. Boris Johnson calls the first lockdown. And overnight, everybody's told to stay at home. Um, I've, I don't know whether... You, I've never seen anything like it. I don't suppose... I've, none of us have, no. Um, London was completely deserted. I can remember driving over... Um, Tower Bridge, and not a soul around. Um, you would see the occasional police car, and that was it. It was like, it was, it, to me, it was like um, a, a sci-fi movie. Um, the authorities in the Abbey decided to close site work down. Um, to be honest, the reason for that, I think, was because overnight, they lost uh, all of their revenue. There's no visitors. There's no money coming in, and, and, and they would probably have about £2 million of revenue coming in every month, and that was gone. So the whole project w w was stopped. Um, the other site, the Holywell site, um, that's not the case. We thought the site would be closed down any day. Every day I thought the site would be closed down. That's not what the government decided to do. The construction industry was told to carry on. Everybody else went home. There was no project manager, no consultant, no planning officer, no historic England. They'd all gone home. We were left, in some ways I felt abandoned. Looking back on it, I was, you know, it was probably just as well. Because they would have all been chipping in. <laughs> you know, <laughs> as it was, I just had to work with a site manager and we had to carry on because that's what we were. We were part of the construction industry and this project was going ahead. So we set up, we had to write, or I had to write, site operating procedures for COVID. I had to apply to all our staff. So think social distancing, washing of hands, no sharing of anything. So we had to have individual tools, pens, pencils, um, only one person using the dumpy level or the cameras and then cleaning everything. We had to have um, um, one-way systems around the construction site, uh, temperature controls of everybody coming in. Um, this could only happen with the planning of our clients, their principal contractor, our project managers, well, they're sitting in the office somewhere, um, or at home, actually. Um, and we had to work it out, which is what we did. Now, the, 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 the post-ex staff, and if you like, the, the, the back office, they, they were all set up at home in their bedrooms and their sitting rooms and their kitchens. I'm sure you're all familiar with that. Setting up their own uh, uh, computers and working via, um, you know, online and so on, which was great. But my staff in the field had to carry on going to work. Um, we realised very soon um, that we had to cooperate or talk to the union quite a lot. And so what we did was we established week weekly COVID uh, consultation meetings where we could talk through some of the difficulties, of which there were a lot, okay? Um, 
Uh, we wrote, as I said, like a COVID um, safe working procedure. Um, we're now on version 14. The reason for that was, um, of course you all know, the government changed the advice regularly, sometimes from week to week. Every time they changed advice, we'd have to change the uh, working procedure slightly and tweak it. Um, it was a worrying time for everybody. I, you know, fear and anxiety was a normal response. The problem is if it becomes overwhelming. And it did for some people. There is no denying that. I was surprised sometimes who was overwhelmed and who wasn't. Um, people that I thought would be okay, weren't okay, um, and vice versa. Um, we had a, a mental health first aider team, of uh, which I'm a part, um, which offered advice, support. Um, we communicated not only with our field staff, but also those that were isolated, working at home as well, who were only allowed out for an hour to do some exercise or go shopping or something. Um, and one of the things I observed, that those people that worked in the field that were going out every day, um, in the end would cope better than those that were confined to their house. Um, so that's just something that I observed. Um, we tried to engage with those people working at home. Um, obviously, we're talking about work and, and the, and the vers various managers. We're checking on them and so on. Um, but we also did things where, where we tried to engage with people, nothing to do with archaeology. Um, not quite, anyway. So we asked them to do <laughs> photographs, okay? But of course, archaeologists being archaeologists, you can see what they sent in. Ridge and furrow. Yeah, great. Okay. But it's a lovely picture. But that was, that was just one of the ways of trying, of trying to be nice to people, really. I'm not brilliant at being fluffy, by the way. <laughs> right. On site, here we've got them now in our new, new working method, everybody keeping their two metres distance. Um, I'll not lie to you, in those first few weeks, it was difficult to get people to work in this new way. Um, we put in champions into every trench to try and remind people. Sometimes we had to grid it out with 30 metre tapes so everybody could see with their two metres. Um, I was criticised. Um, I didn't find that criticism very easy. Um, uh, at one point, I was called, or PCA was called, morally reprehensible because I continued to work on site. Um, the person that did this, I won't name, um, but it, they are quite high up, um, said they were going to complain to the IFA about us. Okay? Um, I phoned them up. I said if they got health and safety concern, they should f inform the HSE. Um, they didn't know it at the time. I was undergoing uh, therapy for trauma. Of PTSD. So I have what's called a moral injury, which means my whole moral compass was shattered and it's left me the way I am today. So I found that criticism difficult. I still do. Um, because we did our best and this is what we came up with. People, whether you like it or not, that's what we did. I don't think we had much of a choice. Um, after about two months, the Abbey invited us back. And there we are, we're back, but with a much reduced team. And again, having to do all of that um, COVID, COVID procedures, and quite rightly so. So everybody keeping their distance, um, cleaning the tools, cleaning the, the, the optical instruments, and so on. Um, <coughs> yeah, we managed, is what I would... I don't, it wasn't great, but we managed. So, following on from like Dig Venture, we, we weren't particularly um, up to date with all the social media, and we started to learn this very, very quickly. Um, before COVID, we, we would do things like, you see my colleague over there, my former colleague Becky Haslam, she's doing um, one of our open days at a site in Tottenham Hale. Hundreds of visitors. The 
the public were really interested. They often are when you put on uh, open days. Here she's talking to a, a group of school children. So that's how we used to do it. Of course, when you, you have COVID, we couldn't do that. So we very had to, quickly had to change. So we, we worked much more with Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, LinkedIn thing. I'm not very <laughs> familiar with this. Um, the meetings via Zoom and Teams, the online talks which we carried on to the local societies, the, 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 the conferences that we attended. So we just kept pushing out this, this, method, this message, if you like, um, in, a, in a new way. And I think um, what we've learnt is we won't stop doing that. Um, I'm now much more happier that we're doing face-to-face -face things like we are today, but we will continue, I think, now to use social media. Um, so, yeah, there, there's just a, a, a grab from, from the YouTube channel, and you can see all the different um, talks, that we're, or some of them, that we've, we've put up, and we got, um, on some of them, really quite high numbers of, of viewers. Uh, that I don't think would, would have normally um, listened to this kind of stuff. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm really, really pleased with that. Where are we now? I'm very glad to say uh, at Westminster Abbey, uh, Hidden Highlights Tour uh, this month. And you can go along and you, you, I think you have to pay for a ticket and you get a 75 minute tour of the excavation. It's still there, it's still visible. And the, the, the Abbey are now using it as a way of generating funds. Uh, hopefully, um, they will um, push the button for the post-ex. I hope so. Okay. Eventually, they will build um, the visitor centre. So we're almost back on track there. Um, Shoreditch Village East. Shoreditch Village, yeah. Tell me about it. Uh, it's built. <laughs> it's built. Uh, I'm not sure anybody's in it, but it's there. Uh, I need to go along and have a look. Um, but another successful regeneration of uh, East London. Well, for the hipsters, anyway. <laughs> okay. So I'm afraid that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>